Gemini 7 was launched on December 4th, 1965 at 7.30 p.m. UTC from Launch Complex 19 at Cape Canaveral. It carried astronauts Frank Borman and Jim Lovell on a mission to stay in orbit for 14 days, the longest space flight up to that point and the longest expected duration for an Apollo lunar mission. Could astronauts stay in orbit for two weeks without debilitating effects? Well, at every extension of duration, the medical community expressed grave doubt, but on top of just surviving medically, Borman and Lovell faced a unique challenge of spending that time in the extremely cramped Gemini spacecraft, which could be compared to the front seats of a small car. An unfortunate side effect of the long mission was that they had to conserve propellant, so the 14 days were not punctuated with interesting spacewalks or attempted rendezvous, at least not initially. They had some science experiments to do, but mostly they had a lot of reading time. Borman and Lovell had and continue to have very different characters. Borman is very serious, whereas Lovell is much more easygoing. But despite their different attitudes, they by all accounts got along well for the two weeks and would later be assigned together for the Apollo 8 mission, the first that would venture out to the moon and make orbit around Earth's companion, a fitting reward for enduring this harsh task. Gemini 6A was launched 11 days later on December 15, 1965 at 1.37 p.m. UTC from the same launch pad. Originally, Gemini 6's astronauts Wally Shira and Tom Stafford were supposed to rendezvous and dock repeatedly with an automated Agena target launched on an Atlas rocket shortly before their launch on a Titan. That Agena blew up though, so mission controllers quickly rearranged things so that they would launch after Gemini 7 and instead do the rendezvous with the spacecraft containing Borman and Lovell, spicing up that mission. Gemini 7 will be in a high nearly circular orbit at 300 kilometers and Gemini 6A would catch up, demonstrate rendezvous capability, and then return to the surface the next day, leaving Borman and Lovell to complete the remainder of their long stay in space. On their first launch attempt on December 12th though, the Titan's engine ignited, but then shut down. According to the rules, since the clock had started, Shira, as the mission commander, was supposed to activate the ejection seats. However, not detecting a launch, he decided not to. He had been skeptical of the ejection seats as a launch pad abort method anyway, but in this case his decision saved the spacecraft interior from being torched by the ejection seats and allowed the mission to launch after only a 3 day delay. The rendezvous process was the same as for the Agena, but there couldn't be a docking. In his typical fashion, Shira resolved to handle things as precisely as possible and ultimately brought his craft within one foot of Gemini 7 enough to demonstrate that he could have docked if that had been possible. Also in typical fashion, Wally put a Beat Army sign in the window of his spacecraft to Needle Borman, who was a West Point graduate while the other three present all graduated from the Naval Academy. Borman did not find this funny. The Gemini 6A crew also played a prank on mission control, reporting a UFO in a polar orbit and suddenly receiving communication from it. That communication was the crew playing jingle bells using a harmonica and small bells, which were probably the first musical instruments played in space. The rendezvous took place for five hours, after which Shira and Stafford disengaged and deorbited. Borman and Lovell had nearly three more days to go, and they were especially painful since the cabin stank, the fuel cells and RCS thrusters were starting to fail, and they didn't have energy to do anything. In the end, they managed a duration of 13 days and 18 hours, which was longer than any of the Apollo missions, and a firm demonstration that it could be done. Thank you for watching this mission profile of Gemini 7 and 6A.